Okay. All right, now we're going to break this down. Types of government. The type of government people have is determined by the choices that they have made when they established it. And people who are ignorant of the principles of liberty will always be governed by tyrants and despots. Tyrants and despots rule without any regard to people's rights and the welfare of those people. I can point out to Hitler, to Stalin, to Pol Pot, to Saddam Hussein, to Assad, to the... Um, um, what's the leader's name in uh, Iran? Uh, the Atollah Khomeini, or whatever his name is, or his title. Um, Mao in China. Zimbabwe, Venezuela. Those dictators could care less if 100,000 people or a million or 100 million of their people die. Santa Ana in Mexico, the dictator in Mexico that uh, went to war against Texas, Texas Providence of Mexico at the time that we now know as Texas, said soldiers are just fodder. They're like chickens. Who cares if they die? Pretty typical of dictators. If you do not understand the principles of liberty, ladies and gentlemen, you are ripe for a takeover. Because if you don't know your rights, how do you know that you should even defend them? How do you know when you're being violated by your own government if you don't know your rights? How do you know if I'm not violating your rights if you don't know your rights? You know I can't just search you? Even if I have probable cause, I can't do that. Because you have certain rights, even though you're a minor in school. Doesn't mean you're going to stay here if you don't consent to a search. But I just can't arbitrarily, other than your water bottles, can't just go and start rummaging through your backpack or your pockets. <clears throat> Where do you think that star means? Might be a question on the test. So what is a tyrant? Anyway, we used a word that you may not be aware of. Tyrant. Absolute ruler. He is unrestrained by the law. The law applies to you. There's no law that applies to him. He rules with excessive absolute authority. And a despot, which is the next one, is one that, exceed, that is exceeding power ty tyrannically. In other words, one who is exercising power like a tyrant. They are essentially the same, though people use them a little bit differently. I personally do not understand the difference, but understand when you read, especially like our founding fathers' writings, they will use these two words separately, often in the same sentence. So we know they're using it differently. Even when I look up, I have a copy of our country's first dictionary. Even when I look up the two words, they seem, they seem to be the same. They mean the same to me. So, but understand, there, there is two different, different definitions, though they sure do seem to be the same. Somebody who's a tyrant is also a despot. Any questions at this point? What is the defect in humanity? What is it called? Two words, it's Latin. Say again. Do you know how to speak Spanish? Yeah, yeah, I can't get the accent, the, the, the role, the way it should be said. But it's levito dominante. That's how I say it. That's how this cracker says it. So. <laughs> All right. 
something you need to understand. Intelligence enables the citizen to make sound judgments affecting public interest. Our schools understood that in the 1800s, before John Dewey took over and some other progressives. In the 1800s, I actually have an 1876 civil government textbook. That's what they called American government at that time. There are questions in there that uh, college students could not answer. It's actually an incredible textbook. One of the things it mentions in there, that it taught stu high school students that ignorant voters were more dangerous than an invading army. Ignorant voters were more dangerous than an invading army. Say again. That's right. We have so much freedom in our form of government, which is called a constitutional republic, that if we vote without reason and logic, but with feelings, we will run ourselves in the ground. Benjamin Franklin walked out after the, con after, yeah, after the Constitution was signed, well, developed, it wasn't ratified yet, and he was asked, Dr. Franklin, when he walked out of that building, what kind of government have you given us? And he responded back, Madam, a republic if you can keep it. They weren't sure it was going to be successful because it relied on the intelligence of the people when they vote on who they were voting for. And then those representatives having the intelligence to make the right decisions when it's time for them to make the laws. An ignorant voter was more dangerous than an invading army. All right. We are going to discuss, we won't finish it today, we are going to discuss, though, six principal forms of government. You will need to know all six if you don't remember your pretest. We're going to address six principal forms of government. Now, I could have made a, a list of 10, I could have made a list of 8, 12, but everything boils down into these six, and then we're going to boil it down into to two. These are the six most common that you're going to hear. Then every, every other form comes out of these. You will be asked to list the six forms of government. The first form, I'm probably not going to say this right, but it's patriarchal. It's the first and oldest form of government. And this is where it is the father that's leading or governing the home. One of the best examples we have in the last hundred years is the Lever to Beaver program. If you ever watch that program, you got Ward Cleaver, who is truly the leader of that home. This is traditionally how families have been. Like I said, it's the first and oldest form. If it was the mother that was the leader of the household, then it'd be matriarchal. There are some sub-societies where it is the females that are the rulers of the home. And I say rulers not in a dictator way, but the one when mom talks, everybody jumps kind of thing. There are some subcultures that within Western civilization, within all civilizations, that that's the case. So on the test, if I ask you what is the first form of government, now you know. What is the oldest form of government? Now you know. What is the characteristic of the patriarchal form of government? Father leads the home. So if you go home with your notes, those are the kind of questions you can write on note cards to help memorize and understand this form of government. In our country, it used to be, it was once believed, <clears throat> our founding fathers certainly believed this, 
that our national security rested on the moral sense intelligence and the intelligence of the people when the father was the two true patriarch of the home. When he was home doing what a father and husband should be doing, not being absent, running off, whatever. When he is home guiding his family, guiding his children how to be good people, how to be good workers, that was going to provide the best foundation of, an, of a country's security is the family, a strong family unit. Today, we call this type of family the nuclear family. It used to be called the biblical family. But civil government don't like to use theological terms. Not since about the 1950s, excuse me, 50s and 60s, things radically changed. Okay. Now it's called the nuclear family because in the 1950s, the United States or the world went into what's called the nuclear age with the invention of the atomic weapons. And the 1950s has become kind of the golden years, the golden decade for, the America, for not only America, but the American family. And then you have the cultural revolution of the 60s that we have never recovered from as a society. The second form is theocratic. There's a root word in this up here, theo. What does theo mean? Anybody have good, strong vocabulary skills? Theo is God. God-centered. There's only been one theocratic um, system of government, and that's Judaism. Before, well, they started out as theocratic. Particularly with Moses. It started with Moses. The immediate direction and administration from God. God told Moses what to do. Moses told everybody else. He got his first commands from the Ten Commandments. That if you read the Jewish history books. In Exodus. God wrote the Ten Commandments on two stones. With his very finger. Now, I'm not saying you have to believe that, but under the Jewish custom, under their Jewish history, that's what happened, and that established the theocratic rule over the Jews, or at that time they were called Hebrews. Hebrews were ruled under this system for 1,500 years. And they changed to, to a monarchy with King Saul. And they had a king until after King Harold died, which I uh, believe King Harold died, I think he died before Christ did. But if I ain't mistaken, he was the last king. If there was another king, he was such a weak king that it didn't matter. But, uh, and then, of course, about 30 years later, year 79 AD, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and sent the rest of the Jews uh, all over the world. It's called the Great Disbursement. For 1,500 years, the Hebrew people operated under a theocratic rule. The next form is monarchical. Now, you're quite familiar with this. This is a king. Government is administered by the monarch. Monarchs have the supreme authority over the people. They could be called kings, emperors, czars, sultans. They come by different names. They are all a monarch. By the way, this is King George III, the one that we booted out of here. So what is a monarch? It's the country, kingdom, empire, etc., of which the monarch exercises. The monarchy is the land, the zone, the region. The monarch is the individual. Maybe I need to say it that way. Do 
Do we still have this form of government today in the world? Absolutely. Yeah? But we're going to break England down even a little more precise. Yeah. Monarchs are divided into two power classes, absolute and limited. Remember I told you we're going to break down uh, the Queen of England? We're going to break her down here. We have two power classes within a monarch, absolute and limited. Any idea uh, what the Queen of England is? She's limited. She's probably one of the most limited of all the kingdoms that we have now, of all the kingships and queenships. The absolute monarchy. We get the ideal of absolute power, and more importantly, the divine right of kings. The divine right of kings... <clears throat> or is sometimes called the divine right or God's mandate is a political and theological doctrine of royal and political legitimacy. Wait a minute, I thought we were supposed to have separation of church and state. Not under this time period. Not under, not under this political ideal. This theory does not separate the two. They are actually intertwined so much that the king becomes absolute because God says so. It asserts the monarch is subject to no earthly authority, deriving the right to rule directly from the will of God. In China, they call that the mandate of heaven. If the emperor lost the mandate of heaven, there's typically a uh, catastrophic event that occurs, like a major earthquake with 200,000 people dying at one time, or a mudslide, or a flood where... We're talking about thousands of people dying. That was a sign that the emperor had lost the mandate of heaven and he was going to be replaced. And lo and behold, coincidence being, or maybe divine providence, depends what your belief is, that emperor usually ends up dying within months. No different than Mao when he died in 1976. 100,000 people died in an earthquake. Six months later, he was dead. This ideal began with the Jude in, in the Judeo-Christian world in the ancient Hebrew book of 1 Samuel. The prophet Samuel anoints Saul, and then David was king over Israel. So what happened was, remember, theocratic rule, Samuel uh, is told by God who to go anoint as, his, as Israel's first king. He was told to go see Samuel and anoint him, not Samuel, uh, Saul, and anoint him king. He becomes king. He later loses the mandate of heaven, if I can use a Chinese term, for not obeying God. And King David, when he's a boy, excuse me, the shepherd David, when he's a boy, is anointed king of Israel by the direction of God. The point where the divine right of kings comes in, even though King, or excuse me, even though David was anointed to be king of Israel, because King Saul was still in office, and though Saul was trying to kill David, David refused to kill Saul when he had the opportunity, citing this is God's anointed. Nobody touches Saul. He will die on his own because he is God's chosen king. This is where the divine, the idea of divine right comes from. These kings, rulers, make all the laws, execute laws, and interpret the laws as they see fit. Limited mar monarchy. Not malarkey, mon monarchy. <laughs> this is what the king and queen of England is. A limited monarchy. Laws are created by a separate body. And in England, it's parliament. Laws are interpreted by a separate judicial body. That's the courts. Laws are executed and enforced by the monarch. 
And probably more importantly, depends on your perspective, the monarch is not above the law. He can't go and execute whoever he wants. He can't tax one person X amount arbitrarily and tax somebody else, one of his friends, less. He has to execute the laws equally as the legislative body has intended. The king and queen of England, of course right now we only have the queen. When Queen Elizabeth dies, then her son, Prince Charles, will become king. I assume his second wife will become queen. Um, they, while they are king and queen, virtually have no power. They are, by all purposes, just royal figureheads. They don't sign anything to make a law. They don't even execute the law. That's the prime minister that does that. They are a figurehead. They look pretty and spend a lot of money. Now, does that mean that they have no role to play? No. There's a lot of things that's discussed with the queen. The prime minister has routinely visit, routine visits with the queen. But the queen really only has power because the people in parliament allows her to. But it's not much. And there just really isn't much that she has any control over. That's about it. Yep. She is close to 100, I think. She was the queen during World War II. Yeah. Her husband died in the 50s. That's how long she's been in rule. I think she might be one of the oldest or one of the longest ruling queens. Uh, or maybe even of all the monarchs. So it's, it's possible that her son, Prince Philip, will die before her. He's got to be 70-something. And a lot of people would like to see him abdicate the throne and give it to his son. Um, not Harry, William. I think it's Prince William is, the, is his name. Kate and William. That was William. Or, excuse me, that was uh, Harry. That's right, that's the younger one. He'll probably never be king because they've got a son. Yeah, somebody would have to take that whole family out before Harry ever becomes king. So, yep. So, limited monarchs are restrained by a constitution, and those monarchs that are restrained by a constitution is called constitutional monarchies. All right, so let's take a look at the sovereign's title. The sovereign is the person like the monarch or the king, queen, czar, they are the sovereign. They have full control. There's two basic classes, hereditary and elective. The, uh, the sovereign's title in England is hereditary. In other words, you're never going to be king or queen unless you're born into it. Prince Philip will become king because he is the firstborn of that family, of, of Queen Elizabeth. William will be the king because he is the firstborn of Prince Philip. And if he does not survive long enough to be king, or he dies as king, then his firstborn will become king. You also could have an elective monarchy. What do you, how do you think this person gets into becoming a, a monarch? He's elected. That's right. What is probably the biggest well-named person that's an elective monarchy? That's elective monarch, excuse me. Or how about an organization that is an elective monarchy? Any idea? Today. Huh? United States? Do we have any monarchs? Oh, gosh, no. Founding fathers killed. We would have killed a monarch. 
Russia? No. Nope. Huh? Anybody in here Catholic? The Pope? The Catholic Church? Let's go back to hereditary. We've already talked about the sovereign obtains the title to the throne by his birth. Here we are, the oldest son. If no son, then the oldest daughter begets the crown. Edward VI of England was crowned at the age of nine. Here he is at nine, taking his first porch or painting after becoming king. He had two older sisters. As you can imagine, ladies, if you have a younger brother, how would you like to have your younger brother dictating to you and you having to bow to him? <laughs> they did. He's nine years old, probably a brat. Spoiled one at that, maybe still wet in the bed. And now he is king. William the First, this is what I have read. I'm not saying this to be fact. This is my understanding to be the truth, though. That William the First, also known as William the Conqueror, invaded England in 1006, excuse me, 1066, which I know in fact was true. He defeated the Anglo-Saxons at the Battle of Hastings, and William's descendant has sat on the British throne ever since. Uh-huh. And every British monarch has claimed the right to the throne by birth as a result. Huh? Ever since William I. Not this guy. This is uh, Edward... Uh, Edward VI. William I was a Frenchman. He's from Normandy, the kingdom of Normandy. Those of you who are in U.S. history with me will find that out today. Elective monarchy. As I said, they are elected to the throne by subjects or by the subjects they represent. Malaysia, supreme head of state, is elected to a five-year term. These are just some examples. The king is chosen by the royal council of the throne from candidates of royal blood in Cambodia. And the pope is elected by a conclave by the cardinal, excuse me, the college of cardinals in the Holy Say. Typically, the pope is one of the members of the college. As you can see, it's a pretty tight-knit group that they choose to rule. 